C.G. Young, all right, 1875 to 1961, Swiss psychiatrist, founder of analytical psychology, usually best known as a one-time collaborator with Sigmund Freud, and similar to Alfred Adler, a defector of the psychoanalytic movement. Now, all depth psychologies begin from a recognition and an appreciation of the unconscious and the ways in which it informs our behavior and helps to shape our individual identity. Yet, they differ in key ways. So, they differ in terms of what types of relationships they, they emphasize, i.e. vertical relationships with the parents or horizontal ones with siblings. Whether the utilization of the unconscious gazes towards the past, focuses on the impact of relationships and birth order in the present, or potentially what the unconscious tells us about our future personality, so the telos uh, in the psyche, which is a, a hallmark of Jung's thinking. And particularly in the case of Jung, um, he has really specific ideas about how the psyche is actually structured. And when we say the psyche, that includes consciousness and the unconscious, right? So he has different ideas about how the psyche is structured, the mechanisms by, and the tools with which the unconscious conveys its messages to consciousness, right? So for Jung, the psyche is split into three, right? So we have consciousness, that of which we are aware, right? What do my senses tell me? What can I perceive, right? What can I recognize? How do I engage with the world? That is consciousness. He then goes on to the personal unconscious. Now the personal unconscious is, well, what it says on the tin, right? It's things that we're not aware of, but the contents of the personal conscious, unconscious are of a personal nature, right? So there could be things in our life, right, that just through the course of time, we forget about it. So if you ask me, right, or let's say my sister comes up to me and says, hey, do you remember when we did this when we were five, right, and, and you were four? Now, I might not consciously remember it, but if prompted, right, and if I thought a bit more about it, I could actually retrieve it. It's just that what I did at four years old doesn't quite resonate right now, right? I, I can't hold it in consciousness. So that content goes somewhere. It gets registered somewhere. Right? And for young, it goes into the personal unconscious. Other contents of the personal unconscious usually include things that have been quite traumatic for the individual. Right? So things that would prevent us from engaging with everyday life. And it's usually of a traumatic nature. And nine times out of ten for young, the complexes are built upon some kind of traumatic event. Not always, right? but most of the time, it's some kind of trauma that lies at the heart uh, of the formation of a, a, a complex. So for instance, if there's a difficult relationship, right, and you're finding it hard to go on to continue with work, school, et cetera, well, guess what? What do you do? You consciously push it down. I can't think about this right now. In more severe cases, right, as the other speakers have noted, the psyche actually splits, right? The moment of impact is when the psyche actually dissociates. So Donald Kalshed, who's a, a Jungian, but he also uses quite a bit of object relations theory. In his book called The Inner World of Trauma, he gives uh, an example of, of one of his patients, one of his cases. And basically what happens um, is that there's this girl, right, woman now, who used to be sexually abused by her father every Sunday when her mother went to church, right? So through the course of the therapy itself, what Calshed gets her to, to, you know, to, to tell her is that in those particular moments, the way she actually handled the abuse was that she saw herself from above, right? Almost like an outer body experience. She had to be out of her body in order to distance herself from the physical trauma of what was actually happening, right? So that's number one. And as time goes on, right, one day Kalsha just asks her, I wonder where you went during those moments. And that's the moment she breaks down, right? In those moments, I was in the arms of the mother, right? And now we're kind of getting to Jung's ideas of the archetype. So whereas the real physical mother couldn't be there for her, right? In those moments of trauma, she enters into a fantasy of being held by a larger and greater mother, okay? So that's the personal unconscious, the collective unconscious. So these, this is one of the key distinctive ideas in Jung psychology that distinguishes it from Freud's uh, psychoanalysis and Adler's individual psychology. So the collective unconscious, I'll just read it once because the definition's right here, 
can be defined as the collective general part of the unconscious mind, derived through eons of repetition of human cultural imagery and experiences that, despite differences in detail, remain typically human with recognizable commonalities and meanings. So just one second. So just for the purposes of today, right, because it's infinitely more complex than this, just think of complexes as being the contents of the personal unconscious and the archetypes, which is the focus today, as the contents of the collective unconscious. And because Jung right, says, well, the archetypes are the contents of the collective unconscious, you can't define the archetype without, by default, defining the collective unconscious and vice versa. So you'll find that these definitions usually intermingle and interconnect uh, on many levels. So what I'm going to do now, let's hear it straight from the horse's mouth, right? We're going to go through some definitions, and then we're going to try to distill what I feel at, at this point are just the, the key ideas that we want to take away um, about Jung's idea of archetypes. Okay, so in the psychology, or sorry, in the relations between the ego and the unconscious, written around, I think, 1916, 17, revised several times, he defines the archetype as impersonal collective components. I, i.e. Jung, have therefore advanced the hypothesis that, uh, that at its deeper levels, the unconscious possesses collective contents in a relatively active state. All right, so we'll, we'll come back to this a bit more, but what he means by active is that they're not dead, right? They're alive. One of our colleagues previous, previously used the term constellate, right, which is a very kind of therapeutic depth psychological term. So these archetypes aren't dead, right? They may be patterns, let's say, formed in the past, formed through the, the, the history of human experience, but at the same time, once something triggers it, it comes to potentially play a part in our lives. Okay, let's go to the next quotation. The archetype is a kind of readiness to produce over and over again the same or similar mythical ideas, right? What does Jung mean by this? How does he come to this? So for this, we actually have to go back to his days at the Bergotsli uh, Mental Hospital in Zurich, right? Very famous hospital. Um, at the time, you know, at the cutting edge of, of treating uh, psychotic patients. So it was here that, you know, Jung's really cutting his teeth and how he's really getting into, you know, to Freud's ideas as well. And during this time, he's caring for schizophrenic patients. And his whole approach is that, actually, let's not just lock the door and throw away the key, right? I really want to understand and help these people because really, they're not beyond saving, right? So what does he do? He just begins to listen, right? He begins to collect the stories. He begins to collect the narratives. And what he found was that there was a pattern arising. In these delusions, these fantasies, these visions, a lot of it actually had a mythic character, right? So as a responsible clinician, what does he do, right? It's like, I need to learn more about myths because this is exactly just what I'm observing, right? If I need to decode the messages, decode the potential meaning, and perhaps find the instance, the secret or the trauma that actually caused all this confusion, it's my duty to look into these myths. Right? So that's why and how he actually delved into myths more and more. And that he found that these themes keep recurring in the delusions right, or visions of his schizophrenic patients, but then also later on with his therapeutic patients in their dreams. Right? So that's why myth is such a cornerstone to young psychology and how it's intricately, intricately sorry, tied to the archetypes. Because myth, for young at least, is one way the unconscious speaks to consciousness. Right? And if we have the legend, if we decode it, if we spend time with learning the language, we just might be able to decipher what our own true selves, right? our own innate knowledge is actually trying to tell us. Right. Okay. So we've got through that one now. Right. Now, sometimes as well, right, what Young found really interesting was that these delusions right, or, or these, these kind of fantasies that people were having, they actually brought up a lot of um, rituals, myths, stories that were from a culture other than a Western culture, 
right? And this absolutely intrigued Young, right? Why is it that this person from this particular Swiss canton, who I know has never traveled outside of Switzerland, how is this person all of a sudden producing mandalas, right? Producing images or fantasies of a phallus swirling off of the sun, right? And for Young, he couldn't really explain this, right? He couldn't, at least he says, right? He couldn't explain it through diasporas, um, cryptomnesia, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how he begins to posit this idea of a collective unconscious, right? That irrespective of historical time, of geographical distance, we all have access, right, to this memory, this human memory that's been imprinted on our psyches, that's been gathered by our ancestors, right? And in these moments, we're actually able to dip down into this content and then to express it. The unconscious speaks via, right, these main motifs, etc. But the way they get filtered into our psyches is actually shaped by our own personalities, our own cultures, our own economics, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that's why he felt, at least, it was important to proffer, if you will, this idea of a collective unconscious over and above the personal unconscious, right? Okay, let's keep going. Da, da, da. Archetypes are recurrent impressions made by subjective reactions. I like this one, right? It's a brief one, but I like this one because it actually speaks to my interest in, in the discipline of history. So basically, what you can distill from, from this particular quotation is that he's talking about the history of human experience, right? So by default then, and by extension, every archetypal pattern at one point or another was a real historical experience, right? Something to ha that happened uh, to humanity in general, right? And this is not me, this is Sonu Shamdasani making that important point. So these, in turn, leave an imprint on humanity, i.e. about the different ways one is likely to react in a situation, and it is this that we actually inherit. Now, what Jung is also implying here is that we are predisposed to certain instincts imprinted on our psyches, i.e. the instinct to live typically human lives, right? So what does he give as an example? For example, how do bees intrinsically know to build hives, right? How do migrating birds intrinsically know where to fly, when to migrate, what path to follow, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So for young, this is not learned behavior. This is instinctual. So the notion of an archetype as the a priori determinant of all psychic processes is what young introduces as an explanation for this phenomena. Right? And I was actually very pleased to see when I was looking through uh, the archives of the, the Weekend University that uh, they invited Rupert Sheldrake to give a talk. So his idea of morphic resonances um, actually have a parallel in Jung's archety uh, archetypal theory. So that's very interesting. Now, moving on to another quotation. Not only are the archetypes apparently, or sorry, not only are the archetypes apparently impressions of ever repeated typical experiences, but at the same time, they behave empirically like agents that tend towards the repetition of these same experiences. For when an archetype appears in a dream, in a fantasy, or in life, it always brings with it a certain influence or power by virtue of which it either exercises a numinous or fascinating effect or impels to action, right? So, what can we distill here, right? What can we take away? So archetypes are typical human experiences, reactions, relationships that are expressed as patterns, which may in turn shape our lives in both visible, i.e. conscious, and invisible, i.e. unconscious ways. They can either be constellated or in more complex and severe cases, they can come to possess the individual i.e. the individual has over-identified with a particular idea or pattern, right? And usually when people feel like they're, they're on a course of destruction, that they feel that they can't get out, that fate is actually, you know, controlling their lives to a certain extent. Well, for young, this is just the constellation of a particular pattern, right? And someone's over-identified with it, right? And it's just a recurring circle, right? You're just repeating what the pattern is telling you. 
the more we are aware of them, i.e. the archetypes and their effects, the better off we are, right? We might mitigate its potential negative effects and actually tap into its potential creativity, right? Now, why do we need to know about archetypes? Anyone want to answer that one? Because my livelihood depends on it. So if I can't answer this, I'm in trouble, okay? Why do we need archetypes? What's the added value? What does it bring to our life? So knowledge of these patterns can have a potentially healing effect because it ties us back to our innate shared knowledge of our human experience, which we've forgotten or lost sight of. Now, at the time for young, at the time for young when he was write, writing, he felt that society was completely disenchanted, completely disengaged, right? This was largely due to the fact of industrialization, right? The fact that humanity, if you will, was feeling more and more alien from its surroundings and because of the, the rapid development um, of, you know, of machines, basically, right? So there's disenchantment is one factor. The second factor, and many people have already alluded to this, um, is the loss of religion as a framework, right? The, the loss of religion as a framework for providing meaning and structure in one's life, right? And when God is dead, where do you turn, right? And that's where his therapy, if you will, begins to, to spring up, to, to re-imbue meaning into the world and into individual lives. So, a knowledge of underpinning archetypes may help us frame our current troubles, trials, and ills, with those that have been experienced by all humanity, regardless of cultural differences. Placing our own experiences in a larger context also helps alleviate what psychoanalysts would call a harsh superego, right? Now, the superego in itself is not negative, right? Um, let me just go back and recalculate what I'm saying about Freud. <laughs> the resolution of the Oedipus complex right, aids in the establishment of the superego, which in turn allows us um, to identify with the father, but then also to identify with a more symbolic and larger father, i.e. society, right? So the superego plays a socializing function, and that's all fine and good. The difference here is the harsh superego, right? It's the voice that keeps telling you, you're really weird, actually, right? I tell that to myself all the time, you're really weird. Right? I'm projecting this onto you, by the way. <laughs> you have no friends. It's all your fault. Right? You're the one to blame. You're the one who's broken up this relationship. Right? Um, it's your fault that the kids don't listen. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. No one likes you. Right? You'll never amount to anything. You'll never get that other job, because guess what? You're not good enough. Right? So it's this constant berating and devaluing of oneself, right? which actually cripples life. It really damages life. Seen in another way, you could see, you could call this the guilt and shame right? that many people feel, not all, but many people feel when they're about uh, to enter into therapy. And it's, it's you know, these feelings that we're actually exploring throughout the therapy. So when you frame your experience within an archetypal pattern, you may realize that you are not alone in what you are experiencing, that you are not to blame. And there's this great scene, really moving scene in Good Will Hunting. Does anyone remember the film Good Will Hunting? Fantastic. If you, you haven't watched it, please take the time to watch it. Um, filmed at the University of Toronto, my alma mater, another reason to watch it. Um, but Robin Williams is the therapist. And you know about Will Hunting, very troubled young man, very brilliant young man. And there comes the moment in the therapy where he just tells Jason Bourne, i.e. Matt Damon, he just tells him, he tells Jason Bourne, it's not your fault. And he repeats it, it's not your fault, it's not your fault, you're not to blame, right? And that's a very kind of, you know, emotional and healing moment for that particular individual. So it doesn't all fall on you and the perceived quirkiness of your personality. What you are going through, others have gone through. You are not the first and not the last. And knowledge of this can be, for some, quite liberating. It can lessen the grip of guilt one feels, which can often, as we said, cripple life. Right? So this is potentially, uh, you know, uh, an important effect, right, if you will, of buying into or, per, you know, perhaps uh, entertaining Jung's idea of an archetypal pattern. 
right, of the importance of myth because it potentially imbues life with meaning. We can see your life in larger context, right? And much like Joseph Campbell, although Joseph Campbell was inspired by Jungian ideas, he wasn't a Jungian, so let's just get that clear. But this whole idea of reframing our lives, our quote-unquote mundane lives, right, in, in more kind of mythic terms can, you know, can give us a sense of, um, of meaning in a very kind of mundane, boring world sometimes, a very troubling world. Right. So, also knowing a pattern and how the story ends is a signal to us of what we can do proactively to change things so that a particular pattern does not repeat itself. So a part of the therapeutic process is to break these deleterious patterns that we may actually enjoy enacting over and over again. Now, if a severe trauma has happened, it's not that we want to repeat the trauma, right? Excuse me. Um, I, I think Ruth said that the trauma is history, right? It's the return of the event itself. So in those cases, I, I don't think it's that. But we also have to acknowledge the sense of comfort that we feel or that we find in our psychology, right? In our ills, in our symptoms. Why? Because they actually provide a certain sense of stability and identity for individuals. So it's just important to take note of that. It's not that we're actively, joyously engaging in what ails us, but sometimes they're very hard to let go of. Why? Because they become a part of who we are. So by bringing into consciousness, or by bringing these contents into consciousness and working diligently to change those behaviors, we mitigate the archetype's potential tyranny and control over us. Consciousness returns to us human agency and control of our lives, right? And you can see this in Jung's Young's way of working with dreams, right? That obviously he would listen to the personal stories, he would contextualize it, but when the time's right, he would start to amplify it and to see if there was a, a particular mythic narrative. Now, I usually give an example I've used quite a bit, but I'll just give you a hypothetical one because I don't want to repeat it. But sometimes, right, if, if you see someone or someone dreams of burning, right, of being burned, if you will. I mean, a Jungian might think, well, fire burns away, there's new life, there's rebirth, etc. That's one way of looking at it. But if we amplify it further and further, we might find that someone is being burned, right, because they're flying too close to the sun, right? And in more symbolic terms, what happens when someone's flying too close to the sun? It's someone who is moving beyond his or her station of not honoring their own limitations um, as, as, as an individual, right? So you could see that depending on the context, when someone dreams something so potent, right, such, such a, a very difficult image actually to deal with and to work with, it could be pointing to someone's ambition, right? That you're moving faster and faster, right, towards this end goal and not realizing that at some point, much like Icarus, right? Icarus flying off to the sun, not listening to his father Daedalus, right? That if you fly too close to the sun, the, the wax holding together our wings, they will burn, you will fall, you will die, right? And if you play with this idea of rebirth as well, sometimes that fall is actually crucial to the individual's development, right? So you can see based on the dream itself, collating what we know of the history of the personal circumstances, you might then move on to myths to see whether or not a myth can contain or frame an explanation of what that individual is going through. Right. Everyone okay so far? Yeah. All right, I'll take a drink. Okay, let's see what we have for time. Most people will probably know Jung through the personified archetypes. Okay, the persona, the shadow, the anima, the animus, the wise old man, the trickster, the divine child, the self, right? Um, now, it is not the case that they are real figures, that they're embedded somewhere in our brains. They are metaphors for psychological processes that are expressed both internally and externally in our everyday lives. So Jung, during his own confrontation with the unconscious, actually encounters many of these figures, right? D.W. Winnicott basically says it's proof that he's psychotic, right? <laughs> he writes it, he is psychotic. Um, 
Now, sometimes Jung hears voices, sometimes he sees images, but these were fleeting, right? They were mercurial and protean encounters. So in order to sustain a more constant dialogue with these phenomena and literally asking them, what do you want from me? Right, literally stopping and speaking to them, what do you want from me? He felt it necessary to concretize them, right? To treat them as if they were real, because in many ways they were and are real, right? They're psychic phenomena. We take the psyche seriously. Now, the most important example, the anima. The anima was uh, theorized around this time. So a feminine voice basically tells Jung that the artwork he was producing as part of the Red Book was art, right? So this is voice. It's actually Maria Moltzer's voice, right? That what you're doing here, it's fantastic, it's art. And this is very seductive for Jung. Why? Because at the time he breaks with Freud, right? So the, the, the first half of life, all the things that he built up for himself in terms of esteem, recognition, his profession, et cetera, et cetera, all gone, right? And now he is persona non grata. And this voice begins to tell him, and prob probably insinuates to him, maybe you have an artistic career here. And it comes the time then where he realizes that voice is actually his own inner desire and weakness. And he actually says to that voice, no, this is not art, this is psychology, right? Also very important, and I, I really want to, to hammer this home, is that these ideas, they don't, they're not created in a vacuum. Right? They're created in relationships and because of relationships. Right? So it's not that the, the, the founding fathers and mothers of, of psychoanalysis and depth psychology, they sit on something and say, oh yes, you know, that's the child sucking at the breast, yes, that's introjection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, no. Right? It's actually built and lived through relationships with other people in the inner circle. So it's not that they're just theorizing it, they're playing it out in the relationships as they go along. And I just bring this up because when we're looking at the formation of the anima for Jung, you have to look at the feminine figures in his life, right? Maria Moltzer, perhaps the first, we don't know. Sabina Spielrein, Tony Wolf, right? And let's not forget his wife, Emma, right? So all these individuals have a hand, if you will, at helping Jung formulate the idea of the anima. So just keep that in mind. So, going back to the personified archetypes, these personified archetypes are important for another reason, and we'll let Jung speak. I would mention in particular the shadow, the animal, the wise old man, the anima, the animus, the mother, the child, besides an indefinite number of archetypes representative of situations. A special position must be accorded to those archetypes which stand for the goal of the developmental process. So basically, he's making a link between these specific archetypes and the individuation process, i.e. the process of becoming within Jung's analytical psychology, the, the process of be becoming who you truly have the potential to be, right? Of realizing your fullest potential and wholeness, which for Jung is not perfection, right? It means noting what your strengths are, but also what your weaknesses are as well, right? And honoring what those limitations are as well. So in that sense then, these archetypes or meeting these archetypes throughout the life process are integral to individual development, right? They're stepping stones to the larger archetypal self. So in many ways, individuation is not linear, although there's a definite T loss in young psychology, right? We're moving towards a particular end, right? But it's also cyclical in nature, so it's like a spiral upwards. Right? because we're constantly meeting, constantly negotiating our understanding of these archetypes and how they are personified in our lives as, our, as figures, real figures, right? So it's not that, right, I meet a feminine figure, the first one's my mother, I've dealt with that, I left home, I'm okay, anima, tick, right? That's not potentially the last female figure you'll meet in your life. You can meet a partner. Right? You can meet a boss. Right? You can meet someone again, over and over again. And at each point, it's important, again, to, to know what we've learned from a previous experience and then to build on it and to learn more, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So again, these archetypes are important because they literally build a stepping stone to other archetypes. 
Right. Now, we've got five minutes. I'll just go through one, and then we'll take a break. So the shadow, right? Usually the first archetype that one will meet in therapy. Um, why? Because it, it's pretty much on the surface, right? It gets projected onto people. So the shadow, that which a person has no wish to be without realizing that those very characteristics reside within the individual. It's usually referred to as the negative side of the personality, the sum total of all those unpleasant qualities we wish to hide. Jung, however, also states that it is anything as yet unrealized by consciousness. Right? So it can also point to something more positive within yourself. So if the best version of you, right, if you haven't actually realized that yet, for him, it lies in shadow. Right? You are unaware of it. So again, you have to balance with all these archetypes, uh, you know, the positive with the negative as well. So we usually learn about shadow through projection. Right? So we'll give you an example. So on the surface, an individual may always remain calm, the, always the, the veneer of agreeability, sociability, et cetera, et cetera. So what we find out, though, is that such a person casts a huge shadow, and it is usually someone else who cops it, right, who becomes the vessel for that unlived negativity. And it would usually be a partner, a neighbor, or someone close to the individual, could be a child as well. So there's an example in, in uh, Memory Streams Reflections. Young goes and visits a minister who is renowned for his piety, right? So Young spends three days walking around this guy, completely shadowing him, actually. And he's trying to pick holes. He's trying to find what's this guy's story, what's wrong with him. And after three days, he's baffled, right? He's like, I, I'm a bad person, right? This guy over here is perfect, and he's really on the verge of going home and really thinking about his life, i.e. perhaps thinking about what he does to his wife, Emma, when he invites Tony Wolf for Sunday roast, right? Because that's exactly what he did. Um, but then he speaks to the minister's wife, right? And realizes that all his negativity, all those projections are actually cast onto her, right? She's the sinful one. She's the one or sorry, the reason why my life isn't going the way it's supposed to go, right? She's the reason for all my faults, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then Young realizes poignantly, yeah, that's where the shadow is. It's been projected onto the wife. Okay, um, we've gone through that. Hmm. What is the shadow a shadow of? What is the shadow a shadow of? The shadow is a shadow of the persona, right? Our next archetypal figure. So the persona is the social mask one wears and presents. It denotes what one wishes to be seen by others. So some of you who, who have social media, think about your LinkedIn profile, right? Think about your Facebook picture. What picture do you have up there? Is it the night, you know, the picture of you after drinking, blurry eyed? Probably not. Right? It's usually, if it's not, you know, it could not be a picture of you, but that says something about you as well. But if it is a picture of you, it's usually a pretty good representation of what you want the world to see. Right? So fair enough. So that's the persona. Now, we can have multiple masks depending on our social roles. Right? So for me, for instance, I'm a son. I'm a father. What else am I? A university lecturer, sometimes. <laughs> a friend, a really annoying colleague to others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so there are many social roles I have to play. Now, for me, when I think about the persona, I think about decorum, right? What does decorum dictate in a specific situation? What informs the way I react in any given situation? So the persona is the mechanism by which the ego relates to the external world. That part of the total personality that is concerned with collective adaptation. So it is also linked with survival, conformity, our relationship to authority, and by extension, our relationship to father figures and our desire to court those holding power. Now, some people may say, right, and level at the person, uh, the person who's very conscious of putting on different masks, that they're actually fake, right? 
mate, you're fake, right? You're not real. You're not being real, right? You're just putting on a mask. Um, and this is, you know, a, a shot at someone's integrity. It's a shot at someone's authenticity that people aren't being their quote unquote true selves in their everyday life. And for me, one answer to that is that it's not actually easy being the real you all the time, right? It's tiring and neither is it really desirable to be the real you all the time, right? Because if we go back to Freud, the real you might want to act on those id impulses constantly, <coughs> right? And if you're acting on those id impulses constantly, is society actually going to survive? Now, I think authenticity, right, and being able to express yourself freely, whether it's anger, it's aggression, that's fine in manageable chunks, right? But it's not something we actually want to indulge in if we're actually interested in cultivating society. And for young, that is partly our responsibility of maintaining society and playing our part within society. One could also argue that those who would level such accusations are really wearing a mask of their own, right? The mask of authenticity, the mask of being real, when really what they might be masking is a desire or longing, or sorry, a longing to belong, to fit in. Perhaps someone has been wounded by an experience and so in, re, re, uh, in retaliation overcompensates and identifies with the opposite, anarchy, disorder, where in reality, the wish is to bring greater order and regularity within oneself and the way in which we relate to others. So having personas is not, uh, sorry, is an aspect of maintaining a healthy psyche. We all have to don these masks in order to survive and not alienate others. The problems begin when we actually over-identify with one particular mask, right? Where we only see ourselves as one particular thing. And I thought this was a great example showing my age. Jim Carrey, The Mask, do you remember this film, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, okay, fine, whatever. But, <laughs> but the symbolism of it, of putting the mask on and then not being able to actually disidentify and take it off, right? That is where the danger of the persona lies, right? Of over-identifying with one particular way of being. Now, I'll make the next segue, the next link, and then we'll, we'll have a pause for a break. So, say from my perspective, I'm a man, right? And right now in my life, I am too consumed with this idea of being the male breadwinner. I must provide for my family, all right? This is a man's duty to do this. And what Jung would actually say that in the unconscious of this particular individual, right, we have a very undeveloped anima, right? So you have this, this opposition, if you will, between a very strong way of being in consciousness, by default, what lies in the unconscious is undeveloped. And ultimately for young, that is the soul image that is undeveloped. So we've made a link between the persona and the anima. And, and this is what Jung says uh, in the relations between the ego and the unconscious. Can everyone hear me? Hello, check, check, check. Hello? Yeah, you can hear me? Okay. The socially strong man is, in his private life, often a mere child where his own states of feelings are concerned. His public discipline, which he demands quite particularly of others, goes miserably to pieces in private. Ouch. So I've got lots to do when I, when I get home. All right. So we find then a tension or opposition between the external persona and the interior life. An overly developed persona, in other words, often betrays a lack of engagement with our own interiority. Right? So that's basically what Jung is saying, positioning the persona with the anima and the animus. He goes on in Psychological Types to write, as to the character of the anima, my experience confirms the rule that it is, by and large, complementary to the character of the persona. The animus usually contains all those common human qualities which the conscious attitude lacks. If the persona is intellectual, the anima will quite certainly be sentimental. The complementary character of the anima also affects the sexual character. A very feminine woman has a masculine soul and a very masculine man has a feminine soul. Okay, so before the rotten tomatoes get chucked at me, 
All right? Let's just kind of go through the motions first, and then we'll, we'll, we'll throw some critiques out there, right? Okay, so with the anima and the animus, consciousness and integration of the anima and animus is integral to the individuation process, and it's often described as the bridge to the self, right? The anima and animus is often described as the bridge to the self. So we've kind of built up with these archetypes here. So we've got the shadow, right? Usually the first archetypal imperative that we meet in Jungian therapy, right? What is the shadow the shadow of? The shadow is the shadow of the persona, right? If I hold too strongly to my persona in a social role, it usually means that my own interior life, i.e. my soul image, is weak and undeveloped. And in order, right, to become more fully aware, more developed, I need to get in touch with that image that is my complete opposite. Hence, moving from the anima and animus to this notion of the self. Right. So, like we said, obtaining a more complete picture of oneself necessitates an integration of what we consider uh, other, an, Im uh, sorry, an inner image of our complete opposite. The anima is the inner image of a woman in a man's psyche, characterized by typically feminine traits, i.e. an inclination towards feeling, intuition, and being better at expressing and managing emotions, among, amongst other things. The animus is the inner image of a man in a woman's psyche, characterized by typically masculine traits, reason, logic, conviction, consistency. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> Wait for the punchline. <laughs> now, Jung writes a lot about masculine psychology and not feminine psychology. Why do I say this? Because you might say to me, well, actually, he wrote quite a bit about the anima, right? And yes, the anima, re you know, refers to femininity, but if you think about this idea of the contra contrasexual op opposite, when he's talking about the anima, he's talking about the male psyche. He is not talking about the female psyche, right? So there is certainly a gap in Jung's thinking on the animus and female psychology. Other people have taken it forward, the field has moved on quite a bit, but I'll just give you some, some classical, or sorry, some references to, to classical thinkers on the topic. So Eric Neumann, The Fear of the Feminine. Someone else mentioned Marion Woodman. One of her books um, is called Addiction to Perfection, The Still Unravished Bride. And many of you will already be familiar with Clarissa Pinkola Estes, Women Who Run with the Wolves, right? But obviously, you know, the, the field of Jungian and post Jungian studies has moved quite far away from, from this line of thinking. But just going back to Jung, being in relationship with the contrasexual opposite is particularly important because these images usually shape the way we interact with partners, for what we seek within is often mistaken for what we seek in others, mainly life partners, spouses, and those who we decide to share our lives with. If brought to light, we are no longer unconsciously dominated by the archetype. Then there will be fewer illusions in relationships and hence better bonding and understanding. Right? Now, let's rip this apart then. <laughs> there are a few assumptions at the heart of Jung's thinking about the anima and the animus. Number one, he assumes that individuation is only possible within heteronormativity. Right? Is the male-female bond the only one in which this heightened realization is possible? And the answer to that is clear, absolutely not, right? Moreover, the concept of the anima and the animus smacks of an essentializing tendency that unfortunately is the birthright of archetypal theory, right? If you buy archetypal theory and you read it to the letter, right, then yes, it does lead to this very conservative um, and very closed way of thinking, mainly, that this is what it means to be a man, and this is actually what it means to be a woman. So my colleague, Andrew Samuels, has posited that both anima and animus resides in all individuals, and that maleness and femaleness were useful ways one could describe that which is not I. In other words, the soul image that stands in opposition to the persona. Right? So it's not linked to biology, it's a metaphor. It's a way of thinking about that which is not I. Yet equally, it has become clear that such descriptors are no longer appropriate and fail to encompass the full complexity and vibrancy of everyday life. 
it fails to speak to the reality of contemporary life. So for example, when it comes to parenting, uh, Andrew again speaks of the good enough parent of whatever sex, who, depending on the situation, can father and mother when the need arises. Fathering is not the exclusive domain of men, and mothering is not the exclusive practice of mothers. We have to resist the temptation to split roles, i.e. nurturing comes from the mother and discipline comes from the father. In practice, such stratifications are inaccurate and fail to acknowledge an individual's ever-shifting role and capacity for a plurality of reactions and experiences. Right? So there's a lot that needs to be done with this concept of the anima and animus. Some people might still find it to, to be a helpful way of thinking, but in reality, it certainly needs to be updated in, in key ways. And there are many Jungians and post-Jungians working in this regard. Now, moving to the final archetype we'll talk about quickly, the self, right? Perhaps the penultimate personified archetype. It both guides and is the goal of the individuation process. It is an image of our fullest potential, right? Um, in many ways, who we were born to be, what our ideal actually is. And it's usually symbolized in dreams as mandalas and divine figures. Jung at times conflates the self with the God image, or that images of God can be explained via the archetype of the self. So this then leads to many accusations against Jung that he's psychologizing God, excuse me, that, that he's reducing the experience of religion itself and, and religious belief to some, some psychological function, right? So there is a lot of debate on you know, the way in which Jung is actually presenting or interpreting religion from a psychological perspective. Now, one key symbol of the self that I, I just want to point you towards is the, the, the last one there, right? The hermaphrodite, right? So Hermes and Aphrodite together, right? Male and female a symbol that unites the masculine and feminine, and again, a symbol of our potential wholeness. So again, we're tying in this concept of the anima and animus and how crucial it is to an understanding of a more complete and whole image of ourselves, i.e. Um, in the hermaphrodite. In real life, we may project an image of the self onto mentors and teachers and people that we idolize, right? We want to be like them. We want what they want, we think we want what they want. And in part, good teachers, good mentors, you know, and not necessarily in the psychological language, would be able to, to see the role they, they actually play, but then encourage people to let go of it as well, right? That your own indivi individuality means carving your own path, right? In many ways of killing the image of the mentor and the teacher, um, and not to be over-identified uh, with that particular person and not seeing that person as an individual, i.e. a person who has shadow, right? A person who is actually not perfect. Right, now, moving on to the archetypal image. So Jung makes a distinction between the archetype and the archetypal image, and this is what we're going to unpack now. So the archetypal, oh, sorry, the archetype is universal, providing a skeletal framework that gives shape to human experiences. It's an analogy, right? Or I'm going to present an analogy to you. So what we inherit is the scaffolding around the building. Each building is different and unique. And for me, this is actually quite nice because I don't live in London anymore. So coming back to London, seeing the land, you know, the, the, just the, the sheer difference, right, of, of old and new, it's, it's actually quite fascinating. So lovely to, to see that in London. So the shape of, of buildings may be different. Its contours, its edges, the number of windows, the materials used, yet it still embodies all the qualities of a building, right? We can recognize it as that is a type of building. In a similar vein, an archetype may provide a rough blueprint or sketch, but the way in which these plans are executed and expressed can vary depending on personal circumstances, culture, history, politics, and economics. So what I'm going to do now is provide an example of what Jung means by an archetypal image, right? So that's one of my goals. I'm also going to try to show how analytical psychology's ideas remain salient in a rapidly changing world, and how these ideas may help us to better understand and frame our own culture and experience, and what this may be telling us about what lurks in the unconscious. Now, obviously, this 
example is highly subjective. Um, it speaks to my own personal interests and also my interest in education in the psychology of religion. So if it's not your cup of tea, just bear with me. So as we mentioned earlier, Nietzsche proclaims God is dead, right? Jung was actually quite interested in Nietzsche, perhaps too interested in just telling us why he was so sick, right? And then what went wrong with him. But for Jung, with the statement, God is dead, Jung's perspective on it is that, is it the fact that God is dead or that an older idea of God no longer resonates with humanity and that perhaps the idea of God takes shape in new forms and guises? If traditional images of God no longer contain our experience of numinosity, they no longer speak to how we want to see or conceptualize that which is completely other than, our, uh, other than from, sorry, other from ourselves, then other images will rise. We still possess that archetypal urge to worship something that is beyond ourselves. It may not embody a typical God image, but we give it a godlike status. And for young, this could be money. Right? This could be science. Right? So we don't worship God anymore, but we worship money. We don't worship religion, we worship science. Right? Equally, there's a danger of then worshiping young. Right? And that's a large part of what we try to do in post Jungian studies, is actually to, you know, to take young off that pedestal. Right? Because that's a lot to project on one person, this idea of a guru, this idea of perfection, of you know, one system providing meaning to the masses. Um, so just be a bit thoughtful and mindful of that. So my question is this, where have the gods gone? Where have our gods gone? Now it's a, it's a pretty stupid question because the slides were, <laughs> were handed out earlier, so you know where I'm going with this, and I am going here. All right, not quite there, one sec. Have you noticed the extent to which superhero films have come to dominate the cinematic landscape since the 1990s? Right, very interesting. Um, obviously, there's Christopher Reeve, right? I remember that very clearly in my childhood, but at the time I was growing up, it was The Crow, James O'Barr, right? Very dark, very interesting graphic novel. Black Panther is now the first superhero movie in history to receive a Best Picture nomination at the Oscars, right? Some of you probably thought, wasn't it The Dark Knight? No, it wasn't, right? It should have been, but it wasn't. <laughs> the question then is why, right? Why now? And it's more than just because the industry has, you know, the, the software, the computer power to actually convincingly pull off some of these special effects, right? And sometimes they don't, right? So in one of my papers, I talked about uh, the digitized Hulk in, um, in Ang Lee's adaptation of the Hulk, right? Not brilliant. Do you remember Wolverine's claws in the, yeah, in the first origins? Yeah, me too, man. I want my money back. I really do. That was horrible with the sink. But anyways, right? Now, there's obviously something to be said about having the tools to produce those rich images that you actually see in the illustrations right, in, in the real actual graphic novels and the comics. And, you know, some of it is actually phenomenal. But special effects on their own do not make the movie, right? Great special effects do not guarantee box office success and critical acclaim. So why now is certainly one question you could ask of graphic novels and comic culture from a psychological perspective. Could we be witnessing a psychological process of compensation? The rise in popularity of the superhero genre may be telling us something about the culture itself, i.e. the need for escapism in light of worldwide upheaval. Or simply, it's just the case that we need heroes, right? In a very dark time, we need heroes. Comic book superhero culture may also express something of the politics of a certain period, and many people have written on this, right? And it's a, it's a very, very interesting field that comics can serve an ideology. But even within this framework of this perspective of reading comics, you can add a psychological flavor to it, right? It can still speak to it. So look at these images, right? Captain America versus the Nazis, right? And when he was done fighting the Nazis, Captain America, commie smasher, right? Very interesting. Even the Hulk, right? When he wasn't off battling aliens, and scientists in the military, he also found the time to fight the commies, 
right? So very interesting. Now, comics and the superheroes that populate their pages may express and represent and contain the anxieties, fears, and fantasies of a culture at a specific point in time. They are both historical artifacts and windows or keyholes into a deeper psychological understanding of a culture or society at a given point in time, right? So we can read these, right, as images of potentially our collective fears and anxieties, right? They can be compensations to speak to those anxieties and to live it out in a very particular way, right? So in that sense, comics are not childish, right? They're anything but. Okay, now, it may also fulfill a religious need, right? And that's what I'm going to focus on now. So if we go to, and again, we're emphasizing here the difference between an archetype and really the archetypal image. And I'm looking specifically at ex the experience or archetypal experience of Messiah figures. And I'm gonna focus specifically on the life of Christ. And the question I'm asking is this, what are the main motifs or themes that define his life? Now, you could probably choose others, right? This is highly subjective. I've obviously chosen headline points that prove my point, right? So, so be very wary and, and, and conscious of that. But hopefully, you'll still find it compelling. Now, equally, right, I'm not saying that the life of Christ or Jesus of Nazareth is a myth. We know that it's not. Right? So there's a whole field of scholarship of the historical Jesus, some very interesting work. And even from historical accounts of Josephus, we know a man named Jesus of Nazareth actually exist, existed, right? and that he did certain things to piss people off, which then led to his crucifixion. Okay? So I'm not denying it. What I'm trying to do is just to put that aside, right? to bracket on it, uh, sorry, to bracket it, and focus on its rich symbolism and what it may point to psychologically that is the need it fulfills and the meaning it actually provides. Okay, so the need it fulfills and the meaning it actually provides. So let's look at the life of Christ, okay? So, number one, he is not a typical human child, right? There's usually some miraculous birth or some, you know, miraculous origin story. And what is it in the case of Christ, right? He's the son of God brought into the world by a virgin. Very rare indeed, right? So, tick, right? We've got the first bullet point. I mean, you could also then play with the ideas of the divine child, new beginnings, et cetera, et cetera, but we'll just leave it at that for now. Number two, abandonment or a threat to the self, right? So you see this theme cropping up in a lot of stories, much like Moses, right, was abandoned in a basket, Hephaestus, Right, the smith god also abandoned. So in the life of Christ, we don't have abandonment per se, but we do have a threat to the self, right? What happens? Um, Herod wants to track the child down, right? And he fails for quite a long time and then decides to kill all the male children in Bethlehem under the age of two, right? And thank goodness there was an insider, someone tipped off Mary and Joseph, and they fled to Egypt, right? Before the child could be killed. So certainly we have a threat to the self, tick, right? Number two, paradox as the essence of the Messiah figure. So here I'm really talking about the tension that the individual holds, right? How the, or sorry, the tension the, the individual symbolically holds. So for Jesus Christ, it's the tension between being both man and God, right? I mean, with the Gospel of John, you, you see this, this very kind of idealized figure of, you know, Christ, oh, I turn the other cheek, I'm all good. Well, you know, Christ was also there to bring the ax, right? And you see moments of his humanity throughout, um, you know, the narratives on Christ that people just really don't appreciate, you know, the pain he feels in Gethsemane when he's just begging his father, please, please, please let this cup pass from me, right? So it, it's really important to, to then note this dichotomy or this tension within the individual that there's something divine with the individual, but then also something very human. Um, and also significance is to be found within simplicity, right? He's a carpenter, right? Nobody expects the car a carpenter to be the son of God, right? To be humanity's redeemer. So take, we have this idea of a paradox. The overcoming of physical death, which points to themes or psychological themes of death and rebirth. And do we have this? Yes, we do. 
Jesus is crucified, but rises again in three days' time, right? So there's this idea of being twice born that uh, Young discusses at length, uh, sorry, at length in Symbols of Transformation. Everyone okay so far? Okay. The life of Cal L, AKA Clark Kent, AKA the Superman. So we go to point one, not a typical human child. Yes, uh, you already know where I'm going with this. Cal L is an alien sent from another world by his father as the planet Krypton is dying, right? And he will also come to have a dual identity, a normal and rather clumsy journalist as a persona, if you will, and a being of superhuman strength powered by the sun, i.e. Apollo, right? This already points to, to point number three. Okay, so point one, tick. Abandonment, threat to the self. Do we have abandonment? Yes, he was abandoned by his parents, right? By his father um, in particular, He's raised by the Kent family, Jonathan and Martha Kemp, uh, sorry, Martha Kent, um, and another commonality he shares with Christ, they have surrogate fathers, right? So you have Joseph here, and you have Jonathan Kent over here. Okay, abandonment threat to the self, tick. Paradox as the essence of the Messiah figure, right? Well, yes, we do. We have godlike abilities, yet an individual living as a normal human being from Kansas, of all places. Okay, Superman is a man sent from the heavens by his father to use his special powers for the good of humanity. All right, so we're definitely seeing some parallels here. Do we have the overcoming of physical death? Does Superman die, and does he subsequently rise from the dead? Does anyone? Any comic aficionados? Yes, he does in 1992, <laughs> all right? So here's my copy, much easier to carry than um, Henri F. Ellenberger's, you know, quintessential work, the, you know, the, the history of the unconscious. Um, this is obviously a Bible of sorts, hermetically sealed in a Ziploc bag for that extra layer of protection, okay? So yes, he does. In 1992, Superman dies. Now, many argue that the death of Superman was a, public, uh, sorry, a publicity stunt to drum up interest for falling readership, right? And certainly it was that. But equally, you could suggest that there is certainly a constellation of an archetypal narrative or pattern, right? And to add to the connotations or the religious connotations, who actually kills Superman? Anyone? An alien being called Doomsday. Right? So then you draw the parallels back to the Bible. You have an image of revelation, of the apocalypse, of the end of days. Now, after he is killed, there are several competitors to the throne until Superman rises triumphantly again and notes the Christ like main to boot. Right? So you have some of the imagery, right, that's pointing to more traditional religious representations of Christ. Now, if you also look to the cover, right, of the death of Superman, right, there it is, sorry, you can't see this one, what does that look like, anyone, right, okay, so we have here Michelangelo's Pieta, right, Lois as the Virgin Mary, now, you could argue that the authors and illustrators purposely drew on this parallel to convey the Christ-like qualities they wish to attach to the Superman, Yet equally, the idea of a superman, or sorry, a superhuman being, a metahuman, the ability to be more than what we were meant for, is intrinsic to the human condition. In other words, this fantasy of being able to transcend boundaries, to test and push limits, is archetypal. These figures are the manifestations of our own creative impulse and proclivity towards an idea of wholeness and completion and not merely perfection. So I'll emphasize this point again, because if we look at every superhero, no superhero is perfect, right? There will always be an Achilles heel. Superman has his kryptonite, and Batman, well, he's Batman, right? He's all too human, right? He's, he's got some psychology to deal with, definitely. So, but these heroes act despite their limitations while personifying a state of being transcending what may be considered quote-unquote normal. 
But there are other religious elements of comic culture, other than the figures themselves, to which analytical psychology may speak. Comic-Con. I've never been. I'd love to go. Right? Anyone ever been to Comic-Con or even London Comic-Con? Yeah, OK, fantastic. Right? So what happens at Comic-Con? So it's usually a conference. Uh, the one I'm thinking of specifically is in San Diego. We have stands for merchandise, the opportunity for autographs, to meet artists, writers, to you know, listen, or sorry, to hear announcements, panels for upcoming films, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's taken very seriously, right? For the people who are in comic culture, they take it very seriously. You might say even religiously. So for instance, the devotion of fans and a franchise's ability to speak to their desire and expectations can resurrect or sink a project, right? So if you think back to the Batman franchise, right, the movies I remember are the Tim Burton adaptations. Then overall, I thought they were pretty good, actually. Who am I to, you know, to say what I think? I thought the first one was second, uh, sorry, the first one was better than the second one. But overall, a bit quirky, very Tim Burton-esque, but people like them, that's fine. What happens after that? Oh dear, right? Batman and Robin and Batman Forever, okay? Those two films almost literally single-handedly sunk the entire franchise and the superhero genre, right, in general. So it took a revisioning, i.e. Nolan's trilogy, the Dark Knight trilogy, to bring the Dark Knight and, and the DC franchise as a whole back to its former glory. So the reverence for characters can reach a fever pitch and evinces a religious preoccupation or devotion, right? And here's my point. Again, the archetypal urge or the religious function of the psyche cannot be suppressed. It will find a way to express itself. By extension, Comic-Con and related events are sites of worship and devotion, right? Now, what leads me to say that? Well, what do some people do at Comic-Con? They dress up. Right, this phenomenon called cosplay. Um, many people engage in cosplay, dressing up as your favorite heroes, not dissimilar to rituals in the pagan world where celebrants dressed up as objects of their worship and enacted their dramas in festivals and ceremonies. Comic-Con may be understood as a mass celebration of the new gods. The event itself provides a safe space to live up fantasies and dress up as the gods they worship. So, Comic-Con and conventions also serve a containing function to draw the parallel to the safety created within the therapeutic relationship in space. Now, just a few concluding words. Okay, let's bring it back to Jung. So the archetype is inherited, archetypal images are not. There could be multiple images and variations, and here we see Jung moving away from the essentialist aspects of his thinking to one that is more nuanced and culturally aware. Yet equally, the reason why myths and stories continue to fascinate is because it is one way the unconscious communicates with consciousness. One way that our own innate knowing tries to relay to us what our psyche needs and the means of achieving it. Similarly, psychological symptoms do not always signal ill health. Rather, they can be seen as invitations to greater self-awareness and personal growth. It is the compensatory relationship between the unconscious and consciousness that gives rise to the mythic themes and fantasies that populate our dreams, and it is the archetype which appears to us as an archetypal image that signals to us which part of our life requires attention. So, in very simple terms, what is Jung trying to say via the theory of archetypes and the distinction that he makes between the archetype and the archetypal image, all right? Basically, he's saying there are similarities in human life and there are also differences. And this could be read as a rather banal insight. Uh, <laughs> all that for just that, yeah? Some things are similar, some things are different, right? A rather banal insight that denotes confusion in Jung, right? And let's face it, he really wasn't the most consistent person intellectually, right? Perhaps as a therapist he was, but not intellectually. Or we could read this another way. We could see the theory of archetypes, or sorry, we could read the theory of archetypes as someone's attempt or struggle with the profound paradox of our very existence and trying to find the language and tools to give voice to it, all the time knowing that such formulations 
will never fully do justice to this tension and the psychology that lies behind it. All right. And that's it. Thank you, everyone.